Thanks for tuning in to Men for the Win, a podcast hosted by David Kufis and Dan Thompson, two avid fans who appreciate well-played baseball, especially when it's done by the twins. Men for the Win is sponsored by The Grand Group with Edina Realty. Are you looking to purchase a new home in the Twin Cities area? Or perhaps you're trying to sell your current home? Whether you're upsizing or downsizing, The Grand Group with Edina Realty will meet all of your housing needs. Contact The Grand Group by emailing the grand, G-R-A-N, group at edinarealty.com or call them by phone at 612-817-8751. The Grand Group with Edina Realty, seven-time Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine Super Agent Award winner. On this episode, David and Hoag's recap the Twins' three-game series against the Miami Marlins. Thanks for listening. Enjoy. Thanks for tuning in to Men for the Win. My name is David Kufis. With me today in studio, Andrew Hoag's Hoganson. Dan Thompson is still out just traveling the world, gallivanting. Sometimes I question his commitment, Hoax, that he wouldn't cancel that trip I still to the start of the twin season. I still can't believe it. I mean, are there any more important episodes to be here? You got to cancel that trip. Baseball's more important, man. Dan, where are your priorities? But to, he did text us that he listened to the podcast, so we got we got some viewership over in Chile right now. <laughs> it is funny to look at. We can see like where the podcasts are downloaded from and to see one in South America. I'm like, whoa. Oh, well, that's kind of <laughs> cool. Expanding our reach. Oh, it's Dan. <laughs> so the twins tried their best hoax to keep our optimism in check and they they used all their offense up in game one and our hype was probably as high as it possibly been and then game two and game three we kind of came crashing down as the bats went silent i hate these series because the twins actually pitched pretty decently in this whole series and you just want to average those runs all the way out and you have a series sweep but instead we're talking about losing two out of three um i was actually kind of tempted to go over there because my family's down in tampa right now so we thought about making the trip over to miami which is pretty aggressive for two kids and everything but but I'm kind of glad we didn't because the last two games would not have been that fun to watch. No, if you're a Marlins fan, it was lots of fun. <laughs> it's true. I mean, game two, if we would have shown up a little bit late, we might have missed the whole game. <laughs> it's true. My goodness. Well, with that, let's get into the series recap. Series recap. Game one, Hoax. If you're a Twins fan, this is the only game you're going to want to watch. Twins come away with this one 11 to 1. Finally, finally, the bats come alive. Yeah, it's nice to see Kepler get a home run, to see Gallo get another home run. I mean, at this point in time, you're just starting to think like, man, should we start sizing up the rings already? You're putting up 11 runs against this team, but then it didn't, it didn't work out so well after that. Now, we should keep in mind that Johnny Cueto left early with injury, and a couple of those home runs were hit on him while he was pitching, clearly not having his best stuff. All in all, I'll still take the offense, Hoax. Oh, yeah, you put up an 11 runs against anyone, I'll, I'll take that. And this Marlins team, for as much grief as they've been getting over the last couple of years, they have a decent pitching staff. I know Cueto isn't as good as he used to be, but I mean, this this staff is solid. So 11 runs is, is a good good production. Yeah, it was sad that it seemed like Kepler finally got things figured out and then immediately gets injured. They, they're not saying that it's serious, but Hoags, this team has a history of not saying things are serious when we don't see a guy for quite a while. Minnesota sports has a history of not saying things are serious. I mean, look at Carl Anthony Towns. I mean, not to get down a rabbit trail or anything, but they said he was going to be gone four to six weeks and then he takes two months. I mean, so anytime a Minnesota sports team says a guy's fine, he's going to be back, I just, I take it with a grain of salt, but it was really sad to see him get hurt. It seemed like he was finally starting to get Get things figured out after a really rough first series but hopefully we get him back I think he still is very important to this team specifically his defense but like we said a lot of those guys have to really mesh with what we have in on first base left field and right field in order to for Rocco to be able to take advantage of that deep bench we keep talking about exactly and then so there was a sad moment to this series probably for most twins fans anytime you see a player that was well loved by the fan base start for another team your heart does get a little you know it's got a little tingle it's a little ouchy you know it's my, my little girl says it's a little ouchy <laughs> but so seeing a rise batting for the marlins was sad but it was kind of funny that he gets his first at bat he gets a pitch clock violation for not getting ready in time it's such a weird deal too for him to be traded to an nl team and we're playing them in the fourth game of the season and then lopez pitched today too i mean it's just it's such a weird weird situation but yeah he's definitely missed and i i support that trade i think that was by far the correct trade which is very easy to say after lopez has had the starts that he's had so far this year but man he was such a likable guy out on the field uh it was fun watching his at bats i'm gonna miss the shaking his head at every single ball that was called on him but yeah it was a bummer seeing him in a marlins uniform you know it feels like there should be a lot to talk about for game one but really it was lots of offense from the twins great pitching from the twins we didn't even mention tyler malley so he goes five innings pitched only gives up one earned run one walk with seven strikes strikeouts and then it went uh Alcala and Sands to close out they each pitched two innings apiece honestly I think that's still the brightest part of this whole series not to get too far ahead of ourselves but the starting pitching throughout this series was phenomenal 
Yeah, absolutely. It just seems that every every tweet I see from Twins Twitter is talking about the starters and their ERA and how they're the greatest lineup that this team has ever put together from a rotation standpoint. <laughs> I, I mean, my Cy Young pick is pre- looking pretty good here. I mean, what do you, maybe they'll be one through five in the AL Cy Young this year. That's the way things are going right now. <laughs> Okay, well, with that, let's uh, let's get to our sad part of the episode here, Hoag. So, game two, this one finished in under two hours. So, if you blinked, you missed it. But my goodness, El Contra, Hoag, complete game, no earned runs, one walk, five strikeouts. This offense just looked overmatched in this game. I go, I go both ways on this one all the time because it, it looked like the Twins kind of threw up the white flag in game two, knowing who, knowing who they were going against, going up the, the reigning Cy Young winner. But at the same time, don't you want to see how you stand up against those guys? But you you know you're probably going to lose. I, I don't know. It, this game just left me kind of wanting a little bit more. It was an absolutely phenomenal pitching performance by him. The Twins could not see pitches. I mean, they were just swinging at the first pitch nonstop. And sometimes when you're playing against a guy that that's that is that good I know you want to jump on him early but you got to make him throw because at the very least you got to get him out of the game early and he throws a complete game against us and yeah it just was not their best offensive performance and then it sets the Marlins up for game three because they'll have their whole bullpen to be used that day but what's most frustrating here is that I think Arise saw more pitches in his first three at bats than the Twins (laughs) saw in the first three innings hoax it was terrible yeah I mean I mean it's 2023 if I told you that a starting pitcher was throwing a complete (laughs) game in the fourth game of the or the fifth game of the season that's insane I mean so credit to him but you got to make him work harder for that yeah and it's a little bit disappointing because Maeda's first start of the season is overshadowed but he pitched very well in game two here so Maeda went five innings pitched only giving up one earned run it was a solo shot but he struck out nine hoags yeah, I mean, this is where I'm going to really focus on in game two because Maeda was one of the guys that I was the most worried about coming back this year. I mean, you don't know what a guy's going to do when he comes back from Tommy John. And granted, he got basically a full year and a half before he came back because they talked about bringing him back in August last year, but just based on where the team was, they decided to keep him. And it sounded like he looked really rusty in spring training where he was having trouble finding the strike zone, but to come out in his first start and get nine strikeouts, I could not have predicted that. And I think all in all, that's the the bonus that I take from this game and the way I'm feeling good about it. Yes, and I did like his reaction when he gave up the homer to Garcia. He looked so upset. Like, he he knew he made a mistake, and he knew that Garcia capitalized on it. But you just like to see that, especially for a guy who, you know, he could have come in with a mindset that's sort of like, hey... Let's just test the waters. Let's just see how we're doing. But no, clearly he came in with the, I'm going to be the pitcher that I was before I got injured mentality. Last note on game two, this game ended with a double play, unfortunately, with Correa on first headed to second. And I just have to say, just go watch the replay of Correa diving out of the way of this throw to first base. Hoax, it was like someone had shot a gun, man. That guy was down on the ground. (laughs) It's such a different, that part of baseball is so different than what it used to be. I mean, you used to have yes. guys with their spikes holding up to guys' faces to see if they could break up the double play. And now you have people doing whatever they can to get out of the way, which, I mean, ultimately, I think is a good thing. But yeah, it definitely it just, can be a little shocking. It, it looks like a soccer flop. Kind of. it's, like, it's like it's like he's like, ah. He, he had so many talk about MRIs this last year. He's not going to do anything to get himself in the, even the realm of getting hurt. Yes. All right. Well, game three, I would love to have something else to tell you folks, but twins lose this one five to two. And again, the starting pitching was not the problem here. So we had Lopez in his second start of the season, goes seven innings pitched, only gives up three hits and one earned runs, eight strikeouts. Now, here's the thing. Yes, hitting always speeds up to pitching as the season progresses. But still, this Lopez for a rise trade right now, Hoags, looks great. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I think that's good to temper enthusiasm with with saying that hitting is generally behind. But at the same time, then maybe that's why we lost these two games and our starting pitching is is there. I mean, I, I, I'm I still going to take that as a win for, for how, with how well these guys have pitched. I mean, we're, we're at six games now, and it's hard to poke a hole in any of the starting pitching performances that have happened so far this year so hard not to be optimistic I keep trying to just poke holes in it but I can't yeah so Willie Castro I wanted to mention here he got he didn't get credit with a hit they called an error on Segura but here's the thing he hustled out of that box and if there's one thing that a player can do that makes me want to like them is follow Jake Cave's example by hustling (laughs) out of the box 
Especially a guy that's like a borderline roster player too. I mean, you got to yes. earn your way. You're not, it's not like you're Carlos Correa where they're saying, "Hey, don't." That's not the place to get hurt. You're too important to that team. And I still respect that. I think that that it has value in the game of baseball today with keeping your your stars healthy. But these guys that are borderline, just seeing all that effort no matter what, I love it. That and that's going to endear yourself to your teammates too. One other note here too. So obviously Lopez came to the Twins from the Marlins, so they're very familiar with him, and they must have thought that they had something in their back pocket. Uh, Justin Morneau pointed this out that they must have come in with a mindset knowing when they could steal on Lopez. But Lopez, man, he was wise to it. The team caught two guys stealing, and it wasn't particularly close in either instance. On that topic, are you surprised that the, there hasn't been more stolen base attempts, at least from like the twin side of things? I mean, I know that they're up in the majors, and like the success rate is way up so far this year. So you got to think that teams are going to start running. But for the Twins, at least, it kind of just seems like same old, same old. Yeah, I mean, so Castro had an attempt and then Taylor actually did have a successful steal in this game. I do wonder if that will increase as the season progresses. But yeah, the Twins certainly seem to be still sort of taking a pretty conservative approach on the base paths. And it's it's hard to fault them for the Royal Series specifically. When you're playing from the lead, you're not generally going to steal as often if you're trying to get those runners in start, scoring position. So it could be more situational. Um, but that's one thing to watch. I just I feel like they have guys that have a little bit of speed. So it'd be interesting to see what they do. It is a little bit of a bummer for the Marlins because uh, Jazz Chisholm was injured stealing second. I don't know how severe the injury is, but he slid into Farmer's leg and he kind of got his, his mouth sort of jammed and he didn't look good. So he came out of the game. Hope he's all right. I mean, he's a guy who's an exciting player. You want him around for the sake of baseball. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. If you pick, if you had a short list of guys that are just super important and vital to the game of baseball, he's on it. He's so fun to watch. He's so exciting. The, his passion that he displays throughout the game, I, yeah, that would be a huge loss for not only the Marlins, but for Major League Baseball as a whole. After this wonderful start from Lopez, it's just sort of thrown away Jax comes in and I thought he looked good in his first couple of batters faced and then they got on him so Rocco with a quick hook brings in Thielbar to put out the fire Thielbar just left a couple of pitches in the zone just not fast enough Thielbar has an okay fastball right it's not great by any stretch of the imagination but he left it in a spot on a couple of those hits, including the homer, that was just like, what are we doing here? Yeah, you know it's a bad game when your firefighter comes in and he's not able to put out the fire, which it's it's frustrating that a start that, that was this good was wasted by that, but you're going to have that with the bullpen. I thought we'd see it more with guys that are at more the beginning of that bullpen than at the end of it, and I mean, we have a few comments for Rocco on that when we get to that later on in our segments, but yeah, this was this was an interesting game and hopefully more of an anomaly for those two guys. Fingers crossed, yeah, because those two guys are going to play a pretty pivotal role in those mid to late innings outside of Lopez Duran and I guess Pagan. I don't know. We'll get to him in a second. <laughs> um, one other note here. I do have to say I'm waiting eagerly for the ump scorecard to come out for this game because I really felt that the Twins got sort of the short end of the stick, both sides of the ball. So it was quite frustrating, especially because there were a couple of big moments that were impacted. I know I'm being a homer, but even through the Royal Series, I was noticing that a little bit too. Do you think, David, here, I'm going to put my conspir- my tinfoil hat on. All that gesticulating that Rocco did when he got tossed in that game, are the umpires taking note of that? They don't like the Twins anymore? Are we getting the raw end of some of these deals? <laughs> that's that's definitely what's happening yeah, here. I, I'm I can't even say it without laughing. <laughs> he probably wrote them a handwritten apology after that game about how I was only mad at New York. It wasn't you guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, Hogs. enough of this. Uh, let's go ahead and get into our segments. I'm sort of trying to push this off as much as possible because i just hate this next segment right now Touch them all, Kirby Puckett. puckett's picks winner puckett's picks winner hoags i am so disappointed i just i can't seem to get my act together here dan took larnick who scored 12 points you took buxton who had negative one and i took correa because my rule still stands if a correa is available i'll take him Correa had five points. I thought I had a chance here, but Larnick just was too good. See, David, what you're forgetting is how cold Correa starts the year. And I know it's not cold in Miami right now, but he just he's feeling his Minnesota roots right now, and he, he can't hit above 190 until we get into May. Well, this is quite disappointing. Season standings now. Dan has one victory. Hoag slash listeners have one victory, and I am currently winless. And Dan, it needs to be pointed out, Dan's currently in Chile, and he knew we were recording right now. He logged on to the spreadsheet just to put in the note dan is the season point leader i love it. that is commitment i love it. that hey, is commitment our zone defense is working out great against you this year this is this is fantastic dan we got to keep it up we we can do it we can do it it's it's a good good start to the year keep picking korea david i'm okay with that for a while all right let's go on to beast versus bench beast 
versus Bench. Is losing fun? Is losing fun. Well, Hoax, I'm, I'm going to let you go first with your beast pick. So this is more of a statement against myself than, than anything else, really. I'm picking Gallo as my beast because I knew I should have picked him for Puckett's picks, and he hit a three-run homer in game one. The rest of the series didn't go that well for him, but I believe that that was my fault because if I had picked him for Puckett's <laughs> picks, he would have kept on producing. Maybe he just didn't listen to the podcast until after the game. He just figured I would be behind him and the listeners would be behind him. <laughs> I'm going to try and show a little bit of remorse to Gallo. So by picking him for the beast, because I feel like the series would have gone differently after that. So yeah, Gallo's my beast. And, and in all seriousness, it is still nice to see him producing as much as he had has at the plate so far this year. I'll take three homers and six strikeouts. I just will with how this team is set up right now. Yeah, I, I think it's not a terrible pick, especially if you just look at game one in a vacuum. Yeah. Because game two and game three, there wasn't much to be said for anybody from the offensive side of the ball. That being said, I am going to go with Trevor Larnick. He went four for 12 in the series at four RBI, and it's important to note, he was the only lefty to start the game in game three. So there has to be some faith there that, that Rocco has that they'd keep him in. Now, granted, some of this is you need players to play somewhere, <laughs> like, so you don't necessarily have all the right-handed batters, but... Is there a different left-handed batter you'd rather have in your lineup right now than Trevor Larnick? My favorite thing about picking Gallo is that you had to pick Larnick, which is Dan's Puckett's pick winner. And I just <laughs> I just wanted to see that. Like, you guys, you can't see, but he's tearing up right now having to talk about how well Larnick did. So I, I love it. I love it. But yeah, I mean, when when a guy's bat is that hot, you have to keep him in the lineup. It doesn't matter who's on the mound. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what side of the plate you're batting on. You just got to keep a guy like that in the lineup. All right, well, let's go on. Who do you have as your bench hoax? I picked Buxton for this one, and I was I was torn on this one. I almost picked Theobar or Jax because of just the letdown that they had in Game 3. And I know I'm filling in for Dan Thompson, but my name isn't Dan Thompson. And you can't pick a guy that only pitches in .2 innings pitched in a whole series. So I went with Buxton. And again, this one's it's, I'm kind of defeating my own point here because he didn't play in Game 2. To me, you'd like to see him coming off the bench in that game. And if he's not available, even with playing DH, I, I think that that hurts him. He went he offered in Game 1, and then he went 1 for 4 in Game 3 with just a single. He is the heartbeat of this team, and we need more out of him. So I'm definitely grading him on a curve, but it would have been nice nice to see more production in game two and three so i'm gonna go with miranda he went one for ten and he left six guys on base so this was a rough series for miranda i know he's sort of still warming up in the field but buddy buddy we brought you for your bat you gotta bring the lumber my friend i am not throwing away my shot and he was so hot in spring training too so it's disappointing to see that fall off so early but again we're gonna repeat myself it is early and the pitchers are generally ahead of the batters so i'm i'm not concerned yet no alarms all right well let's keep pushing to rocco's rewind rocco's rewind so i'm gonna piggyback off what you had said about buxton and not seeing him in game two i don't really mind that buxton didn't start in game two what i mind is that in the top of the ninth, Gordon's batting with Correa behind him. If there's not a time to pinch hit Buxton, I don't know what time there is in that moment. I texted a buddy the inning before, and the Twins went three up, three down in, in the eighth. And I said, oh, I'm sure that they'll pinch hit Buxton for Gordon. We have that whole question of, is Buxton's off day really going to mean an off day? Is this the answer to that question? I think you let the guy take in a bat there. So for those who are scoring at home, that is five games into the 162-game season before David got off of the Nick Gordon train and wants him to be pinch hit for Byron Buxton. <laughs> but to, to the summation of your point, though, I agree with you. Like, you, you want... I, I am totally fine with him taking a game there. I mean, we, we want to keep him fresh. I thought the whole point of this DH stuff was to be able to use him in pinch hitting and pinch running situations because he brings so much value in doing that. And I'm really wary that maybe this is a sign that when it's an off day for him, it's an off day and he's not doing anything. And I this is going to be something that I'm watching very closely as the season goes on. I honestly, I didn't even think about that. Like, yes, I'm still on the Nick Gordon train. But hang on, hang on. Let's just, to put it in perspective, if I'm going to take a train and I'm going to take it cross country in Japan and I can choose just a normal, you know, sort of locomotive that just sort of makes its way or a bullet train, which I would describe like, I'm still on the Nick Gordon train. I'm still conducting. But on the weekends, Hoax, on the weekends, I leave the Gordon train and I take the bullet train of Byron Buxton home uh, to my family. It's, it's hard to argue that. I'm taking the buck truck every time, too. <laughs> Is it a truck or a train? My analogies are all over the place here, Hoax. Holgers are like onions. 
we got to do some sort of analogies when Dan's gone. Just because we're not as good as yeah. it as the English teacher is, we still got to try. <laughs> and I still am trying to understand the difference between illusions and metaphors. It's when he's not here, hoax. I'm just I'm hopeless. Ogres are like onions. End of story. Right, well, let's let's keep going here, uh, Hogs. What do you have for Rocco? My question for Rocco is: In Game Two, in a very high leverage moment, how I would interpret it, in a one-run game, in the sixth inning, Emilio Pagan comes in, and that just doesn't seem like he should ever be on the field in that situation. I'm getting so sick and tired of the well, he's got the stuff. Yeah, but it also gets hit, and it ultimately worked out in this game. But I just I wonder if he is going to be maybe not a high leverage guy, but a medium leverage guy, and that just seems like it's not going to work. Clearly they kept him on the roster for a reason and if he's on the roster you have to use him but like you said earlier this sort of seemed like the white flag lineup and so it sort of cemented that when you put in Pagan in that moment I was just surprised that Correa was in the lineup yeah and in a game that you're at that point in time you're very much in though I mean is it just a white flag for the entire game I mean that goes back to your point about Buxton too is that they're just like well we're not going to score yeah it, it was a interesting choice but I think honestly that's going to be the norm until Pagan screws something up I think if that's the case and we are still seeing him in August in those situations I mean cool <laughs> all right well let's keep pushing here Minnesota moment. Minnesota moment. I'll start because mine's kind of sad, and then you can go because yours is kind of happy, but also <laughs> sad. It's a weird time. Uh, but anyway, I'm just a little disappointed that the Twins sort of squandered Maeda's great start. So there was no offensive production provided to him. And the thing is, he left the field. When he came out of the game, there was some some urgency on Twitter that he had gotten injured. But really, it doesn't seem that way at all. And Rocco tried to make sure people understood that, no, he came out of the game. There was no injury. He was just really tired. And honestly, I think we're going to see more of this from guys coming back from injury, especially because the pitch clock forces them to pitch so quickly. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's the reason pitchers slowed down so much is because they've shown that those stats that you can recover in between pitches longer if you take that much more time. I mean, ultimately, I think that speeding it up leads to a more exciting game of baseball. But specifically for the guys with injuries, that's going to be huge because they cannot pace themselves. They have to go fast. Yeah, so we'll talk about that a little bit more in Herbie's headline. But what do you have for, for your Minnesota moment, Hoax? I thought it was really cool that the Marlins uh, used this series for Rocco to present uh, the Silver Slugger and the AL Batting Champ trophy to Luis Arise. That was a really cool moment. It was fun to bring it full circle. I do love that Arise seems to be taking this all in hand, too, like recognizing why they did it. And it's fun to still have him be considered part of the Twins and so that, that they were able to share that moment, acknowledge what a great year that he had last year. And it's exci- it seems like there's no hard feelings throughout all of that. Well, and it's cool because last season there was no guarantee that you see the Marlins depending on the year and so it was it was cool that they could for sure make sure that happened this season I, I still can't get over how much I love this schedule with playing every single team at least once it's so fun and it's so huge for the game of baseball because like just like we were talking you get to see guys like Jazz Chisholm in these games that you would never see before unless you're just watching other games but playing against your own team that's it's so cool all right, well, let's keep going. Mauer's Musings. I just don't know how it can get any better. Mauer's Musings. So here's my thought, Hoax. Jeffers looks like a new guy at the plate. And my question to you, do you think that he's playing himself into more playing time than we thought he'd get? preseason that's a tough one though because Vasquez has looked decent defensively and offensively I mean so far this is a great problem for the twins to have with how these catchers are both producing this year and if you can have two healthy catchers who are producing that you're able to do more of a platoon between them I know they're both right-handed hitters but I think that's that's huge for this team it's just crazy that we're talking about the depth for the twins and it's catchers and starting pitching right it's so weird and again like all of this is early so many things can change but it is encouraging to see him playing well because I think we'd both agree his ceiling is significantly higher than Vasquez's is and the twins seem to believe that he can still reach that and maybe something like this where he has a little less pressure leads to better at bats and better stats all right well what do you have for your musing I think the biggest question right now is what happens if Kepler's actually hurt for a long time like who is the first guy in AAA that we're looking at bringing up for for his bench spot it's really between Walner and Garlic right like that becomes the question it's who would you rather have garlic who sort of you know exactly what he is we know what kyle garlic is he mashes taters he mashes lefties <laughs> and he can he can play an adequate left or right field but matt walner we don't really know what he is I, I think that ultimately it comes down to whether or not that guy is going to replace Kepler in the lineup or if someone else is going that's already on with the club is going to replace Kepler in the lineup. Because if they want Walner up, I think he has to play 
almost every day because that's so important for his development. And Garlic is going to be platooned. We know that without a shadow of a doubt if he comes up here. So I think ultimately the plan of how they intend to use them matters a lot more. But if you're just asking me, Walner's the more exciting choice, right? Yes, certainly the more exciting choice. You know, it could be the whole Miranda situation where he came up and he kind of struggled his first time up. He went back down, he came back up and he started to crush. But who knows? Who knows? And like like we've talked about, the first half of this season is much more difficult than the second half of the season. So wouldn't you rather lose more games in the first half just because it's is you're more likely to win games in the second half. So maybe this is a good time to try someone like that out. And Walner didn't look terrible at the end of his stint last year either. So I, I don't think that he's a guy that you just, you can't count on right away either. I, I think he definitely could produce. So it, it'll be interesting. I mean, in best case scenario, Kepler's fine and we can believe what they're saying, but I guess we'll find out. All right, well, let's grade the series, Hogs. <laughs> series grades i uh i took a little flack i took a little (laughs) flack uh for my grading in the first series here's the thing folks you have to grade each series within that series and that means that i'm not just going to look at the record and say oh well it's either an a b c or d depending on the length of the series and the number of wins there's more to it that goes into this grading rubric and i don't care you can have your own grading rubric just leave mine alone this i will grade this no series. sense though they won the first two games two to nothing and two to nothing and somehow you come away with an a minus on that i still don't get what more you want negative runs like is there something where they get like 17 pitch clock violations they take a runoff so it's like and then that maybe would bump you up there a little bit like i i don't understand that at all but we we digress i this one, you, you're you going to have issues with this. I, I went with a C, and I kind of graded it on a curve just because of having to face Alcantara in game two. Because the Cy Young winner, they just waved the white flag. So in my mind, they kind of went one and one in this series, and the starting pitching looked great. So I'm giving them a C. I just don't understand why everybody else can make up their own rubric scoring rules. And I, I have my own way of doing things, and I just get mocked relentlessly. Because you change yours every single time. There's just And most of yours are just whenever they play really well, you have to poo-poo it somehow. It's just the <laughs> Minnesota sports fan in you that can't ever have nice things. Okay, well, with that being said, I gave him a C minus. So we're we're exactly the same <laughs> amount apart as we were in the first series. You and I have no an issues a. with you. None. Not, no him, issues with that grade at all this time. It's, I gave him an A minus. You gave them a C. I gave them a C minus. I just assume next series will be a B and a B minus. It just it, seems it, to be the it way things be. are there's, going. There's nuance in this grading, David. There is nuance that you cannot seem to understand. No, that's my whole point is that I take into account more nuance than you guys do. What more did you want them to do in the opening series i just don't the know nuance, <laughs> folks. It's the nuance. okay with that yes i i have very similar thoughts uh that that you had as well just the starting pitching was great it would have been nice to see the offense pop a little bit more obviously in game two and game three but sometimes early in the season those pitchers can be buzzsaws man if they're throwing well it can just be really difficult for hitters to produce i'm gonna let it slide this time but hopefully it doesn't continue too long yeah, they, they definitely can, and, and I agree with that. But I do think it's it's noteworthy that we both only wanted to talk about our grades from the first series because neither of us really wanted to grade this series that much, so we had to keep just bringing it back to that, this whole segment. All right, well, let's keep going in Herbie's headline. I don't know, Jack. It looked like Herbeck pulled him off the bag. Herbie's headlines. There just seems to be new stories every day about people's thoughts on the pitch clock, and one issue that that's come up and this is something that affected the Twins directly, was, as Rocco had said, Maeda was just tired because he was throwing, he's coming back from injury, he didn't have the time to recover between pitches. So when he left the game, he was just gassed. And so what what certain teams have decided they're going to do is they're going to start using their mound visits just to give their pitchers a chance to sort of calm themselves down if they're having a rough inning. I, I don't have a problem with this. I think that's actually a good strategy, and they have those mound visits there for a reason. That seems like a good place to use them, and you're still seeing when the game is actually happening, you're not seeing that walk around the mound seven times before you throw the pitch. I can handle if you... It's like a timeout in any other sport. You know that, that that's going to happen. They're going to come back out, and then they're going to start going again. So as long as they're not talking about increasing the amount of mound visits that you can give a team, I think that's a totally fine strategy, and with them using it that way, I think is smart, and I think think that still makes the game better yeah I do wonder because last season they said it was like on average teams used like 1.4 mound visits per game not including pitching changes obviously 
So, but if you started seeing six mound visits per game, I do think that would start to get a little bit grating. Yeah, but there's rules in place to to help like counteract that because a manager can't go or you can't make two mound visits to the same pitcher without pulling him. So there's there's stuff that's in there. And here's one thing that I think we both need to hammer home a little bit. I want Major League Baseball to look at this pitch clock issue that they are not just set in stone that it has to be what it is. Like if, if something is happening where it's impacting the game and everyone can agree like, hey, we need to just tweak this rule a little bit. I think because it's such a major change that that needs to happen and I think they need to give it a shot first but I, I want that flexibility that remain because apparently like we talked about before they can change the rules whenever they want like we, we there might be 30 playoff teams this year we don't know so but and with this one I actually do want them to be able to kind of listen to the players and if there's something that needs to be fixed let's let's look at it Manfred is is just sitting there like this March Madness seems to have a lot of viewers <laughs> Oh, one, we're going to play five inning games and every team makes it single elimination. Let's go. I mean, that's the World Baseball Classic, isn't it? It is. That, and it was exciting to watch. I mean, let's be honest. Also, I think you said Bud C League in the last episode. I did because I was talking about the ties. That, remember the, the All-Star game that when it was in Milwaukee and he was the commissioner and he walked out in like the 15th inning and he's like, it's a tie. We're stopping. And then that's when they <laughs> amended the, the All-Star game rules after that. It was intentional. That is, it that was intentional. is legitimately just a blank spot in my mind, apparently. <laughs> Honestly, Hoax, that's legit. That's pretty funny. And I didn't even make that connection. <laughs> so well done. Well done. I feel like I should have laughed more last episode. Was, I was kind of surprised a little bit because you just looked at me with blank eyes. And I thought I, I did think at the moment that you thought I was saying the wrong commissioner. But then I forgot about it when we kept going. But yeah, I'm a baseball genius, David. Don't forget. Don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> OK. OK. Moving on. Uh, let's uh, do our Puckets picks for the upcoming Astro series. And we'll see you tomorrow night. Puckets picks. So just so folks, if you're new to the show, basically the listeners always get to pick first or if Hoags is on the show, he takes the place of the listeners. We each get to choose a player who we think will perform best in the next series. We have a whole scoring rubric. You can find it on their website or wherever you uh, listen to the podcast. But the listeners get to pick first and then whoever did better, whether they won or scored higher, uh, picks last. This was really tough for me this series because right now I kind of feel like I'm chasing wins a little bit because I, I went away from Gal after he gave me the win and I went with Buxton. That didn't turn out so well. And now I'm going to do it again. I'm going to go with Larnick because he put up so many points for Dan. I'm going to try to steal him away and, and we'll see what happens. Well, that leaves it to me. Oh, David. I got to do it. David, <laughs> it's your rule. I have to do it. Correa is available. I'm going to take Correa and I'm convinced. I'm convinced him coming home to Target Field. The roar of the crowd in his first at bat hoax is going to will him to score points and bring me a Puckett's pick victory. And I think it's supposed to be warm because they, it, when it looked like they were going to start tomorrow, it was supposed to be, what, 35 there in Minnesota? And now Friday's looking like 50 maybe? So, yeah, I think, that, I think that deals with them. I love how we both use different strategies here. I'm chasing victories, and you're just being stubborn and picking the same guy because eventually it's got to work out. <laughs> if there's one thing I am, Hoax, it's stubborn. Uh, <laughs> but it should be noted, too, Dan had to send his picks in ahead of time because he's in Chile, but apparently he can log in and might make notes on yeah, the spreadsheet right. he whenever can mock he wants. us in real time, but he can't make the pick in real time. <laughs> no, uh, but anyway, so so Dan gave the picks of Larnick, Correa, Gordon, which is sort of hilarious because Hoax took Larnick. I took Correa, which to be fair, I took Correa according to a preset rule that I have for myself. But so Dan will end up taking Gordon. Nobody taking Buxton for the Astros series hoax. Well, to be fair, and I don't even know why I'm picking a fight with him. I did look that he was going to take Larnick and still decided to take him anyway. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. Well, well done, hoax. Well, with that, hoax, it's time. It's time to call it a day. Another episode in the books. Twins Astros coming up. What's your prediction? I think this is a big litmus test right here. If, if their starting pitching can continue to produce against this stud lineup that the Astros have, I think that'll be a real good a real good test of where this team is. I, I think they're going to win the series. I'm, I'm still feeling good about this team. I think the offense bounces back a little bit. I hope you're right, Hoax. Well, with that, would you want to send us out? Uh, I'd be happy to, David. Again, I'm excited to record again with you when I get back home to, to Minnesota, and hopefully this warm weather follows me there. But it's been it's been fun starting off this season with you so far. Yeah, thanks uh, so much for filling in. It's a big help, Hogs, and it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. It's It's been great. All right, well, folks, if you like what you hear, please tell a friend. You can follow us on Twitter at Min for the Win and find our Min for the Win Facebook page. Make sure you've subscribed to the podcast on your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube so that you are notified when new episodes are available. And if you could leave us a rating or a like, we'd greatly appreciate it. If you'd like to support the show, further you can find us on patreon thanks for listening and as always go twins 
That'll wrap up another episode of Men for the Win, a podcast hosted by David Kufis and Dan Thompson, two avid fans who appreciate well-played baseball, especially when it's done by the Twins. Thanks so much for listening, and as always, go Twins!